then I've moved on uh, into university setting, uh, so sort of just finished my first year of academic lecturing, which has been really fun, and I'm certainly enjoying that, but ultimately still uh, consulting with sports teams like Cricket Australia and, and now doing some work with Frisbee. So just before I go on to what I'm going to be talking most about today, I just want to dispel uh, some, some myths, let's say, that uh, I've often had to do with, with cricket coaches as an example. Uh, and the first one is what it actually takes to become an elite level athlete. So really importantly, there are two, broadly speaking, major categories that influence whether or not someone becomes an expert. Uh, the first one is individual factors, uh, such as genetics and uh, their psychology, like the level of intrinsic motivation they actually have to become skillful at that sport. And then the other one is environmental, so the quality and quantity of practice they engage in, um, their socio-economic situation and their socio-cultural. And then of course there's about you know, 1 to 10% of, of luck involved with that as well. But ultimately, what I want to say here with this uh, type of information is that you're not born with skill. You know, you certainly might be born with predisposed to certain characteristics, like fast twitch fibers that help you jump higher, sprint faster, things like that. But ultimately, uh, there are number, there are numerous factors that are going to uh, help influence whether or not you become, or whether or not you go to a high level of performance as an athlete. Okay. So basically, what I'm going to be talking about is, is a fair, fair chunk of information, and I am sort of cognizant of, of information overload, but I'm hoping you'll sort of take bits and pieces that, that really relate to whatever's on uh, at the forefront of your mind. So to start off with, I basically just want to talk about or discuss with you what are the skills that underpin uh, what it is to be an ultimate professional or an elite level ultimate player. Uh, and I'm going to talk about that from a particular framework that I think is really relevant to uh, team-based sports such as ultimate frisbee. Um, I also just want to really briefly talk about the idea behind quantity of practice and, and balancing that with quality practice. So leave you with some strategies as to how to design that practice and consider some of the demands. And then lastly, I just want to have a discussion potentially about how science can impact ultimate coaches, uh, specifically from the perspective of performance analysis and performance preparation. And again, I always love having a Simpsons meme in my slides, just to let the audience know where I'm at. So, what does it actually take to become an ultimate professional? If we look at our framework that I brought up earlier, we've got this idea of physical abilities. So, uh, you know, being fast, having great vertical jump, strong, fit, uh, having great sort of change in directions, manoeuvring positions. They encompass our physical abilities within the game. Then you've got your, your technical abilities. So these are the specific coordination patterns that you develop. Um, and obviously, the more skillful you become, the more uh, coordination patterns you're going to develop, such as a backhand, a flick, hammer throw, uh, pulls, things like that. Catching as well is, is another example. So whether or not you can catch as you dive or catch uh, while you're jumping through the air. They're all examples of specific coordination patterns that you develop. We've then got what I think is far more important in terms of developing expertise, and that is the tactical and perceptual abilities. So this is knowing when to perform the right coordination pattern at any given time during any particular situation of a game. Um, examples of this might be anticipating what the opposition's doing, uh, anticipating what your teammates are doing, and then acting accordingly. And then lastly, you've got sort of the psychological element to skills, which is you know being able to regulate your emotions, control anxiety when you're uh, playing in a huge tournament. And then another area that I find quite fascinating, which is the idea of pre-performance routines. So thinking now yourselves, you know, what do you do prior to a game? What are the things that you always keep consistent? They're actually really effective strategies to help you control anxiety uh, and perform optimally, so that you're not over-aroused or under-aroused, which both influence uh, how, we perform, uh, uh, how we perform technical abilities and how external our focus of attention is, so how well we're able to take in tactical uh, or perceptual pieces of information. So a question I've sort of got for the group here is, there, is there any things that uh, you've got at the top of your mind that you think might fit in this category or that I haven't mentioned, or things that you think might not quite fit in these categories uh, that are key fundamentals to ultimate expertise? Cool, so I've covered most of them, I reckon. So basically what the next step was, or what I was really interested, interested in doing is we've got these sort of five categories that we say, we can say underpin uh, skillful ultimate players. The question then becomes, from my perspective, is how important are each of these categories? And that's what I was really interested in doing with exploring some of the ultimate Frisbee players uh, in Townsville. 
So the first one was looking at uh, physical athletic attributes. Uh, so what we did was we profiled uh, a group of uh, players who performed in the Division II national competition in Townsville. And basically we just ran through a battery of tests. Now the numbers there aren't too important, but what I will direct your attention to is the particular uh, test that we ran. So what I was interested in is looking at their, you know, their, their uh, acceleration, so sprint speed over 10 meters, how well they were able to perform different agility maneuvers, their vertical jump, their general reaction time, uh, and then we also had a specific frisbee decision making task. And we collected a fair other number of, of tests that I didn't bother including because I felt like these were nice and important. And essentially what we found were really large differences across all of these players and none actually correlated with the amount of practice history they had in playing the sport and none of them correlated with how well they performed on this frisbee specific decision making task. So what that kind of tells us is that while athletic attributes are incredibly important at a high level, what they don't do is predict or distinguish between two different skill levels. So while athletic abilities are really important to have, they're not the be all and end all of Frisbee skills. And that makes sense. What, what, we, what we sort of talk about, I think from any sports perspective, is we're not looking to develop athletes. We're looking to develop, in this case, ultimate Frisbee players. And so generic abilities like sprint speed, um, predetermined cutting maneuvers, aren't going to be the most beneficial thing if we've got players that have already developed a fundamental ability to do those things. We need to develop Frisbee specific skills. And that led me on to the next little project we did, which was looking at the perceptual abilities of these particular groups of Frisbee players, or ultimate players, sorry. So basically my aim with this little project we did was to examine whether or not there are actually positional differences between handlers and cutters and their ability to anticipate which direction a Frisbee is about to be thrown uh, during a video-based task. So what we sort of, or what I hypothesized was that the handlers would, would be more able to anticipate the direction of the throw compared to cutters, while both handlers and cutters would do better than unskilled novice frisbee players. Um, I'll give you an example of uh, a video that we showed them. Uh, so this is what I called a T4 viewing period. So it gave the most amount of perceptual information to the people watching. So you'll see the video is going to cut out uh, approximately 250 milliseconds, actually it might have been 500 milliseconds, after the throw is released from the hand. It's for another break for Poland. So the video had cut there, and the first question we'd ask the uh, participants, the, the players, is what direction do you think that frisbee is going to be thrown? Left, middle, or right? Um, we also asked them how confident they were in their predictions as well. We had three other viewing periods, so that was T4. T3 was when we cut <coughs> the video as the frisbee was released from the hand. T2 was... Um, just prior to the person throwing the frisbee. So T2 meant there was no, no kinematic information. You couldn't see how the person was gonna throw the frisbee. And then T1 was when the person who was going to throw it caught the frisbee. So the only perceptual information available was where everyone was on the field at that given time point. You, you couldn't even necessarily see where they were gonna to run to. You could just see a general direction of where people were, were running to. So you can see how the amount of perceptual information over those time periods increase. So what do we find? Ultimately, our handlers uh, predicted far more accurately across all time conditions um, than both cutters and unskilled players. What's particularly interesting is this T1. So we found that the handlers, um, this particular group of handlers were able to anticipate uh, about 66%, with 66% accuracy, <coughs> when there was very little perceptual information available. Really all it was is when the person caught the frisbee and all you could see is players sort of running in a general direction and they were still able to perceive that accurately. It wasn't till about T3 that the cutters really sort of caught up um, to the handlers in terms of their ability to anticipate the throwing direction. So what this sort of tells us is that uh, firstly handlers may have a better anticipatory ability and may be able to anticipate earlier uh, than cutters. <laughs> and cutters were only sort of able to catch up to the handlers once that pre-release kinematic information that was made available. So cutters and handlers both were able to sort of anticipate just based on how someone shapes to throw the frisbee. And then basically our, our unskilled group were just absolutely terrible. They performed at, at chance. <laughs> they literally got 30%, th average 33% across all time periods. 
And if you can imagine from a chance perspective, if you've got uh, three particular options, you've got one three chance of getting it right. So they would just go on awful. And that's really interesting because we've, uh, temporal occlusion, this type of study is done with a lot of sports. And often what we see is that once you understand the trajectory of the object, you're, you're able to anticipate it pretty well. Frisbee is not. Frisbee, you're not able to do that. And I think it's because throwers are able to manipulate the trajectory within the air. So you might throw the disc in a particular, with a particular coordination pattern that allows it to deviate its trajectory suddenly and spontaneously, perhaps later in its flight. So there were some instances where you'd see a video, uh, it'd cut 250 milliseconds, or 500 milliseconds later, and it might look like it's going to the right. But very skillful and attuned uh, players would see that it was actually shaping towards the middle. And they'd see open space there, they'd see someone who, who was open to receive it, and they would predict uh, that it's going in the middle. So that was something quite interesting. My question to you as a coaching group is, why do you think handlers were able to, better, able to anticipate better than covers? Please. I feel this vision, yeah. Feel the vision. Yeah. Absolutely, they have a big picture, yeah. Having thrown a thousand times as a handler, they know they just got an awareness, an instinct. Yeah. Yeah, Tim, Tim Lavis said to me the first half a second he captures the disc is just pattern recognition. Yes. Like yes. his brain just goes into pattern recognition yep. and that's all he's doing for the first half a second. And mm. presumably he can do that much faster than I can. <laughs> yeah. I guess I'll so say if this is dip two, then more experienced players are likely to be handling. Mm. Um, yeah, so more uh, like newer players might be cutting and the people controlling the disc uh, have a much stronger background in sport. Yes, that's a really fascinating point that I'll, I'll definitely be getting to the next slide. I think it's a, the specificity of the task and that, that perception is what handlers deal with, whereas <coughs> cutters are most likely to be facing the other way and dealing with different stimulus. They're used to it coming the other direction. Exactly. And that's, and that's a really, really important point that I'd like you to keep in the forefront of your mind is that specificity of the role that you have in that position. Because we're going to be talking about the idea of quality practice a little later on. And what this sort of tells us is that depending on what role you have within the game is going to depend or is going to influence the skills that you develop during practice. Because you're exactly right. You have a, uh, a broader vision of the field as a handler and you're looking for people in space. If you're a cutter, you are looking for space to run into, or you are looking to create space for a teammate. So again, the, having those roles develops different perceptual abilities, or changes your intentions, and that's really important to consider when you think about practice. Yeah. Um, do the participants self-identify whether they're a handler or a cutter? Correct, yes. And we also uh, tried to uh, validate that check by playing a game the next day, mm -hmm. and then basically recording, okay, who played in what position? Yeah. Uh, and fortunately, that was pretty well um, pretty well correlated. There was an issue with um, the utility role. So ultimately when someone identified as a utility, we then sort of watched them during the game and saw whether they played as a handler or a cutter. And that's how we sort of checked that. Uh, going on, just really quickly, confidence scores. There wasn't too much of interest there. Handlers were generally more uh, confident than cutters and unskilled. Funnily enough, the unskilled thought they were as confident as the, as the cutters. So not only did they have no idea, but they also thought they were pretty good. There you go. <laughs> what does that say? <laughs> um, lastly, I just want to leave you with a bit of a table here that I'm not going to touch too much on, other than to say it was really interesting to um, look at the amount of practice hours that the players had reported relative to the position they played. So I'll just direct you, your, your attention to two sort of boxes here. Total number of deliberate practice hours and total number of practice hours accumulated. What we did find is a general... Um, a general effect of handlers having more experience or, or participating in more practice hours than cutters. Uh, sorry, yeah, than cutters. And what that sort of suggested to us is, as you come into the game, perhaps often you start out as a cutter because the perceptual demands aren't as great, uh, or even the technical demands aren't as great, perhaps, as what you are as a handler. You know, you are more or less the general running the game. So that can also be a factor in the greater anticipatory ability that we saw of handlers. It may be that they are just more experienced or spent more time in the game. So pushing forward with this idea of how important is, is the total quantity of practice, how many practice hours you've actually engaged in. 
Uh, I'm sure a lot of you have heard of the 10,000 hours rule. No, interesting, okay. For those of you who haven't, um, a guy named Malcolm Gladwell wrote a book called The Outliers, and it basically popularized this notion that to be anyone can become an expert, all it takes is 10,000 hours worth of practice, deliberate practice. And that was sort of built on this guy named Ericsson's uh, work with musicians and chess players, where he found on average, expert chess and musician players have about 10,000 hours worth of practice. The issue with this is, firstly, it was an average. So you've got people who became experts after 5,000 hours, and you've got people who became experts after 20,000 hours. Uh, tough to do them. And basically, what this also doesn't take in consideration is this idea of different types of learning that you can have. So firstly, you can learn during a game. That doesn't count in deliberate practice. You can learn in the backyard, on the beach, with your friends, when, when practice isn't necessarily structured. So we call that deliberate play when you're sort of just mucking around, maybe trying different things in a pretty safe environment. The other thing about deliberate practice to define it is that it has to be cognitively effortful too. So it has to challenge the player based on their skill level. It can't, if, if you're getting you know, 10 out of 10 throws perfectly to your, to your teammate, it's probably not a huge amount of learning going on there because you just aren't being challenged. And then finally, deliberate practice isn't inherently enjoyable. We, we don't necessarily do it because we absolutely love going down and running uh, you know, five kilometers and throwing 100 discs. Sometimes, sometimes we do enjoy it and that's fantastic, but ultimately this idea of deliberate practice is a sense that you engage in short-term sacrifice, i.e. giving up your time, working really hard to get better at a skill you might not feel very competent at, to then reap the long-term gains um, of skill development. So you can see how deliberate, the, the idea of engaging in deliberate practices is really uh, sexy, I suppose, from a skill development perspective. You can see how someone would get better the more quantity of that type of practice they engage in. Uh, there is a small problem, though. Sorry, what was that graph in the last one? Yeah, yeah sorry. So with this graph, it was basically just the idea. I don't think it applies too well to ultimate, simply because uh, it deals with a lot of other sports that engage kids, let's say, from you know seven through to 18 and looks at the amount of practice hours that they do in that sport. I'm not sure Ultimate Frisbee quite has the, that player base at that age group, uh, but ultimately just sort of saying that the amount of practice hours you engage in as you become better at a task actually increases. So if you think yourself how often you practice and play when you first started Frisbee, once, twice a week, what is it that you do now? Are you more likely to be three, four, five times a week? So ultimately what we're seeing here is this self-perpetuating uh, prophecy where you might have engaged in two to four hours practice when you first started the sport, now you engage in seven or eight hours. So not only have you constantly gotten better, you've also engaged in more practice. So there's one small problem with, with solely relying on quantity of practice to predict how skillful someone's going to become. This is uh, a profile that I pulled out of the um, players I work with in Townsville. Uh, again, all I want to direct your attention to is ultimately what we collected, which was uh, their playing years, so how many years they've been involved in the sport, uh, an approximation of how much game time they, they have participated in, how much deliberate practice and how much deliberate play they had done to get our total amount of Frisbee hours. And you can see even within one team, a Division II Nationals team, we've got five, just under 5,000 hours worth of total Frisbee time to anywhere between 100 to 500. In fact, half the sort of group was around that five to 700 hours worth of, of Frisbee-specific play. Frisbee-specific play. So ultimately, what that tells us and is in line with a whole host of other research from other sports is that the quantity of practice hours doesn't necessarily predict skill either. Uh, it is a really, really important facet of skill development, particularly when you're first starting out. The more practice you engage in, the better you're gonna be during the first 20 to 100 hours, you could say. Um, but rather than quantity, the quality of that practice becomes absolutely crucial. I have a little question for you as well, uh, as a group of coaches. In this uh, group, I highlighted uh, two particular players who came from different uh, socio-cultural backgrounds. And one thing I noticed about them is the relative amount of time, so this percentage, that they spend practicing 54, uh, sorry, this particular person is, uh, what that be, 83% practicing. This person 64% practicing, compared with the amount of time they spend playing, 17 and 36. 
Yet when we look down at all the other, uh, let's say, Australian uh, players, 48% of their time is spent playing, 64, 78, 82, 86. So a large proportion of their time is spent playing the game rather than engaging in practice. My question to you is, uh, why do you think that is? And do you inherently see any potential issues with that? Uh, I have a hypothesis. Yes, uh, well, uh, it's actually quite linked to weather. In that in Canada, you can play all year round. Mm -hmm. um, there isn't an off season where you can't go outside. And um, basically, your option, instead of playing the sport, is to train. Yep. Um, so I think that impacts it. And then I also think that the, the delivery of the sport to an older age group, um, in general, I think you get more social players attracted there as a result. Um, whereas Canada historically has had a much better schools program. So if you come into a sport with that kind of paradigm of team practices, all of that, um, how would you expect to see that kind of data? Yeah, absolutely. Like, and I tend to totally agree with you. Speak with those two players, they they certainly seem to say that, uh, or discuss that where they come from, there is a heavy emphasis on practice. And, and not necessarily bad practice in terms of you know, really isolated drills, but you know, they would talk about the small side of games, they would play um, opposed activities, which you know, sounded quite replicable to the game itself. Um, but it just seemed to be a big part of their culture. I think that also can just be an Australian cultural thing about maybe not taking things super seriously. Like it's yes, just not yes, yep. as encouraged as in some other places where mm. that training is considered like part of being elite, whereas here we're still into that mindset. Yes. I actually hugely agree with that because I, I found it really interesting uh, from my perspective dealing, uh, coming from other sports that are uh, incredibly structured in their high performance approach. So in the fact that there is a participation model and a participation group and then there is a high performance group and they are quite separate. You, you take the really good uh, players from the participation model or they, they themselves self-select and go into a high performance group. <laughs> Townsville, as an example, I think is just starting to do that, where there's starting to be some separation between the idea of playing socially and playing uh, to become better and become an elite. Uh, and that's certainly an interesting space, I think, at the moment. My recommendation to them was that you vastly need to uh, increase the, the number of practice hours that you, that you do per week. So if, if in their week of, let's say, they've got 10 hours to play Frisbee, a greater proportion of that needs to be spent practicing. The reason why, what is actually practice? So specifically speaking, I'll leave it at that definition there. The second dot point is, is probably my, my definition that I think is far more uh, relevant to coaches. And it's the idea of focusing on a specific skill set from the game uh, and repeating that with greater volume. So providing greater exposure of a particular scenario, skill set, uh, ability, whatever it might be, so that it can be then performed expertly during a game. Really important for coaches that when they're developing practice environments uh, that, are, that are trying to replicate a, an aspect of the game, let's say, is that it both needs to challenge the player and also needs to meet the demands or in some way replicate the demands from a technical, tactical and perceptual uh, perspective of the game. So that's really important to consider. So just to give you uh, a, an idea of a particular model that we often work with, um, imagine you've got a totally novice group of players you might engage in practice that promotes the idea that they develop basic coordination patterns. So you might get a whole bunch of frisbee, uh, ultimate players lined up in a row, throwing discs to each other from five meters, and then you increase that to 10 meters and 15. So you develop those basic coordination patterns. Then if you've got a group that's a little bit more skillful and you're looking to develop a little bit more, um, a little bit more skillful components of the game, you might then work, work on their control. And so this might be executing those coordination patterns against an opponent or with an opponent in front of them. So what they learn from that coordination pattern is the ability to control how they throw it. So being able to maneuver your body around an opponent to then throw to someone uh, out in the field. So you've got your basic coordination pattern. The next stage of learning would be to control that coordination pattern, throwing softer, throwing faster, throwing higher, lower, all those types of um, Adapt, adaptability, uh, adaptions that you can make to the coordination pattern. <coughs> and then lastly, you've got the skill component, which is this idea that you are both opposed, you have an, uh, an opposition right in front of you, but you also have a teammate that you're throwing to who is opposed. 
And so you're combining that coordination pattern with the perceptual abilities that you need to develop. So that's a particular example of a learning model. And again, what's really, uh, I suppose, powerful or, or effective about this particular learning model is that it's non-linear. And what I mean by that is that you start in the coordination phase, you would then transverse into the control and then to the skill. And then if you get put into a better team or you're playing with more skillful players, you might actually find that you, you fall back into that control sort of phase of learning. Because ultimately you're just with, you're playing against uh, a team who is just fantastic at staying on their man or, or uh, person that they're marking. And so you've essentially got to develop better perceptual abilities to get back into that skill stage. So that's just a, a particular learning model that you can apply to uh, developing quality practice sessions. On that note of, of different perceptual abilities, I was sort of thinking about uh, our framework in terms of how that might distinguish between different skill level players. So what you might find is that uh, in terms of physical abilities, there might be little to no difference between uh, highly skilled and less skilled ultimate players. Again, this is just a hypothetical that I've put together. You might find that there is a bit of difference in the technical abilities, but ultimately, you know, the, the coordination patterns of a Division I player compared to a Division II player is pretty minute. You might find that they're both able to throw pretty well, uh, catch pretty well, run into space pretty well. Rather, what actually separates them is this tactical and perceptual and perhaps even psychological ability. So their uh, ability to be able to read a situation in the game and know what is needed. Know that we need to force the team to a particular side or we need to shut them down using uh, zone or man-on-man -on -man defense, whatever it might be. But it's just that tactical awareness of knowing what's needed at any given point in time. So then the question becomes is, well, how do we actually practice those particular skills? Um, and there's uh, this idea of a, a practice specificity hypothesis. <laughs> I had to throw in a big word just in this presentation. And ultimately what it boils down to is just prioritizing when you're dealing with quite skillful players, prioritizing problem solving as opposed to volume. So giving players a problem that they ultimately need to solve. So different strategies to, to do that might be to have lots of opposed activities. Um, or if you, again, have quite skillful players, and something I'm a huge fan of is small-sided games. And what you as the coach do with small-sided games is manipulate the size of the field, the number of players, the rules of the game, again, to, to get a particular learning outcome that you're looking to focus on. So hypothetically, if you're, if you're looking to uh, develop a particular, you're trying to train a particular defensive uh, structure with your team, Let's say you want to work on the cup. And so you've got three players that you, you want to expose them to a lot more practice of working together to shift across the field. You might design uh, an environment that is quite, quite wide uh, and not overly long. So ultimately the, the opposition team that let's say is throwing the frisbee doesn't move a great deal up and down the field, but they move a lot across. And if this gives your cup a lot of specific practice to move with the frisbee as well. So they're getting a lot of practice of working together as a unit uh, across the field. Hopefully you're following along with that. Uh, if not, please feel free to ask any questions. One, one thing I also wanted to do with this idea of strategies and, and a checklist for you as coaches that I'd recommend is ask yourself, is your practice session specific to the game and specific to your players' needs? So again, I have a particular example about a defensive structure, but I'm sure you yourselves have certain learning outcomes that you want to focus on with your team. So again, is your training environment specific to those, to those needs? Is there progressions with the activity? Uh, this is important for two reasons. One is just to deal with monotony and boredom. So small sided games are, are really good and quite enjoyable, but you can often lose the intensity quite quickly if the game itself is too physically demanding or if they're just doing the same thing over and over again. So progressions and having different rule sets, um, changing just about anything, will help avoid that monotony uh, and help develop different skills within the same session. Again, as I talked about a fair bit, does it challenge the learner? Uh, again, what I'd strongly recommend is if you're looking to prepare for a, a competition, you know, you've got a, a comp that's a week out and you want to build confidence with your group, you might want a, a practice session that they execute everything perfectly because you want to build their confidence. Ultimately, there's probably not going to be a lot of learning going on because we learn through mistakes. Rather, learning itself is messy. 
you want to see mistakes because you want people to, uh, your players to understand what they did wrong and figure out solutions to improve it. And that might be creating scenarios where they're always outnumbered. So rather than you know, a small sided game, for example, you might have a 4v3 situation where one team is constantly outnumbered. And so they've got to adapt and change the way they play based on <coughs> these, these rules that you've created or this environment you've created. Uh, I won't go too much into the idea of reversibility, which is basically just how often do skills need to be practiced before you start to lose them. Uh, again, I'd say technical abilities, we retain them for a vastly longer uh, period of time than, say, uh, tactical or perceptual abilities. But again, once we sort of forget them and relearn them, we, we often relearn them quite quickly. And then lastly, most importantly, is at all costs, avoid tedium or boredom. Because uh, again, that is the ultimate uh, coach killer. And so this sort of checklist comes from a particular model called the sport model. Uh, as you can see, spelt out, specific progressive overload, reversibility, and tedium. I won't go too much. I was going to uh, chat a little bit more about uh, developing small sided games, uh, but I, I won't just for time. I just want to finish on uh, two more things, and that's uh, just very briefly talking about the physical demands of Ultimate. The uh, reason why I don't want to go too much into this is because I know there's a brilliant presentation on this afternoon that goes into this in far more detail. So, uh, currently, there's little to no research to date uh, that's actually explored the physical demands of Ultimate. Uh, although research is currently being uh, conducted, which is quite interesting. Ultimately, I think there are some really important considerations for coaches. Uh, and the first one is, does ultimately become more demanding as you sort of progress higher uh, across a you know, skill continuum? So do Div 2, do Div 1 national teams have greater physical demands in the, in the game than, say, Division 2, than a regional competition, than whatever? And again, how does that ultimately affect our, our training? Second question, um, which there is a little bit of research on, is do the physical demands of Ultimate actually change throughout the game? So do we have periods of high intensity uh, physical demands followed by sort of lower periods? Uh, and if so, when do these occur? And a bigger question, why do these occur? And then lastly, I think another really important question is do different positions have different physical demands? So again, do cutters work harder than, than handles? Um, do, uh, certain defensive positions run faster, shorter, longer distances, whatever it might be, than other uh, positions as well. So I'll just quickly highlight one particular study that was done a couple of years ago, uh, and ultimately what it found was some evidence of this idea that physical demands do change during the game. Uh, again, you've got to take this with a grain of salt because it was only conducted, I think, over one game. Uh, but ultimately what they found is that the last nine mi minutes of both halves actually had a decline in the amount of high intensity running distance that was covered. So it sort of lends credence to this idea that physical demands in Ultimate may actually change over the course of time. Again, another really good question is, uh, does this happen across all skill levels? Is this something that happens differently during different games? Uh, I think the way to sort of solve that question is to utilize GPS uh, with players during both practice and games. Another table I know I'm very sorry, but I just want to quickly highlight what we uh, did with some of the Townsville players. We got them to play a game uh, while wearing some GPS units, and we recorded the physical demands of that game for them. Uh, ultimately, what we did with that information uh, was we give them three considerations. The first one is the number of repeated high-intensity efforts the players conducted during that game. So what we found was that they, uh, you know, if we looked at the top seven players and the bottom uh, seven players, they repeated about, they had about uh, eight to 17 high intensity efforts. Now what that is uh, in our sort of model is three sprints, uh, three sprints, sprints over 10 meters uh, conducted consecutively. So with very little rest. So you can imagine you might sprint 10 meters, have one to two seconds of rest before sprinting again 10 meters, before sprinting again 10 meters. So that's a high intensity effort. And we found that during the course of a the game, there are about 8 to 17 of those on average. The other one we looked at is how far do they run on average at different speeds? So when we look at our sort of faster speeds, 15 to 20Ks, 20 to 24 and 24 above, we found that on average it was about 30 metres for this particular group. So that was the average distance of a sprint. And then lastly, the number of sprints they actually completed uh, at that sort of higher speeds. We found vary quite significantly, but you've basically got anywhere between 8 and 37 on average. Again, some players work harder than others, uh, and perhaps might depend both on 
physical differences and positional differences. Uh, but ultimately, this is the type of information that uh, a sports scientist like myself can collect for you and your team. And the recommendations that we make to you as a coach um, when you're conducting, let's say, conditioning sessions would be all, all of them should include high intensity uh, repeated efforts. You should consider the average distance your players would run during your particular uh, game at whatever level you coach at. So again, this is quite specific to, to Div 2 national team on this particular day in a very hot town hall. Um, so keep those contextual factors in mind that what I presented may not be totally relevant to you. I'd imagine it'd be somewhat close, but uh, not perfect. So consider the distance, consider the number of sprints, and lastly, consider the amount of rest time that you would give your players. Because ultimately with Frisbee, you might have a play that, that goes from anywhere between one to six minutes or so, before being followed by a two to five minute break while everyone resets. So that, that five minute break may not be ideal to induce physiological changes to get fitter players. What you might consider instead is only having a one to two minute break, depending on how uh, intense you're running. So obviously if you're asking them to do maximum sprints, you're gonna to wanna to give them a lot of rest time in between. If you're asking them to pace themselves, do 60 to 80% uh, maximum intensity sprints, you could probably back off the rest time. Uh, again, there's some ideas for future work there uh, as well. So last thing I sort of want to leave you with is uh, this idea of how can science uh, impact ultimate performance? Uh, and these are two particular ideas that I have uh, that I'm very uh, passionate about uh, potentially exploring. And the first one is performance analysis. So actually exploring uh, what are some key performance indicators during a game of ultimate frisbee that predict who wins. And I also want to know is what events uh, predict whether or not someone is going to score. So some of this research has come out of uh, cricket, for example, where, uh, again, very boring sport, I know, I'm sorry, uh, but they looked at, ultimately, what happens preceding a wicket falling or a batsman getting dismissed. And so one of the big indicators was the number of balls the batter faced where he didn't play a shot, or yeah, where he didn't play a shot. And ultimately, if there were 18 balls in a row uh, where the batter didn't play a shot, their chances of getting out rose to like 70 to 80%. So clearly that was a key indicator. Um, of a dismissal coming up. So what coaches would then do is say, all right, clearly rotating the strike, uh, scoring runs, even if it's only a one or a two, is, is critical. We need to train that with our players. So that's an example of how understanding some key performance indicators could then influence your coaching practices. You might find, you know, if we were to look at this, we might find that X number of passes predicts scoring opportunities. The reason why might be because you've run the defense ragged or you've just you know, kept the game in your total control. Uh, but what is that number of passes? You know, generally have no idea. And it'd be, I think, a really interesting question. The other one is the idea of performance preparation. So looking at, um, psychologically, what do players at the top level um, do just prior to a game? How do they manage their anxiety and their emotions? Uh, and even what do they do during a game, which is another fascinating area. Uh, nutritionally as well, you know, what can we recommend uh, players do to perform, particularly when you have games, uh, two games on one day, or even three games on one day if that ever happens. But I think that's a really big area as well that can be addressed. And physically, this is, um, this is a, the next project we're doing with our council, council group of players. Uh, we're looking at this idea of PAP. And again, I love throwing big words to presentations to make it sound smart. Uh, but basically it's uh, post-activation potential, which is this idea that if you lift really heavy weight uh, for say two or three reps, you will get an increase in your power output for the next five to ten minutes. So if you imagine uh, you, know, you do a leg press or a heavy squat for one or two reps, your vertical jump will increase for about ten minutes. So this idea that you're just basically recruiting more muscle fibers. What we're exploring is whether or not we can uh, develop a, a plyometric protocol. So hypothetically, if you imagine you've, you're about to go on the field as a player, you perform 20 jumps, uh, does that improve your power output for the next 10 minutes? And again, that's what we're exploring. There's some evidence to say that it does. Uh, we're going to explore that with Frisbee-specific players. So I run a sort of four-week program. Uh, and then lastly, from a physical perspective, is looking at the warm-up, cool-down, and recovery practices of players. Again, critical when you consider you're playing multiple games on a single day. I've thrown a ton of information at you all, uh, and I hope you've 
found something, something in that that was somewhat useful to you. Uh, any questions, I'll be hanging around all day. Uh, otherwise, more welcome to ask me now. Thank you. We're going to veto questions now because the next session starts in three minutes' time. Uh, Apologies. <laughs> you're not here tomorrow, right? No. Take off the cool. If you need to talk to Jono, today's the day. Um, he's family, he doesn't know many people here, so you should be able to grab him pretty easily. Thank you, Jono. Appreciate it. So we got Max in here next, presenting on team culture, buy in, and similar concepts. Uh, yeah, we've got uh, Kiara and Simon yeah. on developing and retaining young women. They're in 226. And in 227, we have Manix Narayana presenting Ultimate for Schools in yes. India. In 227. That was shit, Jono. <laughs> 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 Yeah. Go on, watch it. Spray for it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that was oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, 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 Things I like, love the best. Yeah, very good. I definitely signed up the thing. No, sure. No, sure. No, no. 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 No,